your name, amen. Well, you may be seated. So welcome to all of you. I could almost say welcome to all you new people, and that would include many of our members here. So thank you for coming today. It is good to see you. If you would, open up your Bibles to Ephesians 4. We've been working our way through Ephesians for quite some time. We're in Ephesians 4. Today we're going to look at mainly verses 7 through 11, but I'm going to read 7 through 16 to keep it in its context. And in some ways, we're not going to hit everything that is in verses 7 through 11, so we'll probably touch on some of that again next week as well. It'll be just a second before I read our text. Let me begin by just starting out with this. I've started reading a book that's entitled Strength to Love, and it's a compilation of sermons by Martin Luther King Jr. Part of me wanted to just read his sermons because I hear his name mentioned, but I had never read his sermons or anything like that, and so I wanted to be able to hear how this man preached. There's a sermon on Luke 23, 34, and that verse says this, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in that sermon, he mainly had two points. The first point was this, that Jesus bridges the gulf between what he said and what he did, between practice and profession. And he made the point that not many people can do that very easily. But Jesus did. For example, Jesus taught his disciples not just to forgive, but to forgive your enemies. And when Jesus said these words, he had just been crucified and placed on a cross. And while he was on the cross, he said these amazing words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The second observation that he made was that the consequences of us being spiritually blind or ignorant are catastrophic. This is what Jesus said while he was on the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. At the end of this sermon that I was reading, this is what Martin Luther said near the end. He says, one day we will learn that the heart can never be totally right if the head is totally wrong. Let me read that one more time. One day we will learn that the heart can never be totally right if the head is totally wrong. As we come to Ephesians chapter 4, specifically our text today, you will begin to see how God seeks to correct the wrong thinking that we come to him with as Christians even. It reminded me of Ephesians chapter 2 in the opening verses. This is what it says in Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh. And listen to what he says. Carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath. Our minds need to be transformed. Paul says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this, this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And Paul has shown us throughout the first three chapters of Ephesians that one of the things he's continually thinking about is the renewal of our minds as Christians. This is what he prayed for in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 and 18 that we talked about so long ago. I just want to remind you, this is his prayer for the church in Ephesus and our prayer too. I remember you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. And we're going to come to our text today and see that one of the ways in which God will seek to answer that prayer is to provide gifts within the church that specifically target these things. By giving us these gifts, he will equip the church for ministry. He will build up the body. He will help us to attain to the unity in the body of Christ. And finally, it will help us mature to complete manhood in Christ, of which he is the head. 
This morning, we will read Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. Read it with me. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about, ever since we came to chapter four, how grace is applied to the life of a believer. For three chapters, we've been talking about grace being applied to our hearts and to our minds. And now Paul has turned to the application of all of that in the remaining chapters of Ephesians. And so three weeks ago, we talked about how we can live a life worthy of the calling that we've been given. We have been saved by grace, transformed by grace, given a gift. And Paul is saying in the opening verses of chapter 4, now live a life worthy of the gift that you've been given. And he went on to say that that will be evidenced in five ways minimum, probably more ways, but at least five ways minimum, in humility, in gentleness, in patience, in forbearance, and love. We learned in chapter 3 that God saves individuals and he places them in a body with other people. What a wonderful gift. But if he didn't give us the grace to display these five things, how long would we appreciate that gift? If we're in a body and we can't function in humility, in meekness, in gentleness, in forbearance, in love, in these sort of things, how long would that last? Not long. We learned then in the second week or last week that grace also produces an eagerness to maintain the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 3 through 6 told us to do that. And then Paul gave us seven amazing doctrines, seven amazing theologies which should propel us to seeking unity in the body of Christ. This is what he said, for there is one body, there is one spirit, there is one hope, there is one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism, there is one Father and God over all, in all, and through all. Living in the realities of these doctrines will help propel us into the unity that we are to experience in the body of Christ. And now today we come to Ephesians chapter 4 verses 7 through 11 and we see that we also see grace working in the life of the church because Christ has given gifts to each and every one of us in this place. We may not know what they are, but each of us have a gift to use. And even while Chad was up here this morning, I found myself so grateful that I don't have to be the man on every subject. I don't know enough to be the man on every subject. It's all I can do to keep up with this week's sermon. This body has lots of gifts. Lots of grace has been lavished out upon every person in this church. And we should want to use those gifts for the benefit of others. 
These gifts reveal that even though there is to be unity in the body of Christ that we have talked about for the last three weeks, it does not mean that the church is not diverse. We are unified, but we are a very diverse church. Every church that meets in the name of Jesus Christ and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ is diverse in the gifts that it has been given to build up the body of Christ. Dr. John Stott says this. It should pop up on the screen. Although there is only one body, one faith, and one family, this unity is not to be misconstrued as a lifeless or colorless uniformity. We are We are not to imagine that every Christian is an exact replica of every other, as if we had all been mass-produced in some celestial factory. On the contrary, the unity of the church is far from being boring or monotonous. It's full of exciting diversity. He goes on to say, this is not just because of our different cultures or temperaments or personalities, but because of the different gifts which Christ distributes for the enrichment of our common life. You know, there's often a complaint made against the church that it's not diverse enough. And I'm sure if we were to look around in this church, we would say we would long for it to be even more diverse than it is. We should pray for that. I would love, honestly, I would love to see a Hispanic church meeting in our church at some point, preaching the gospel to the Hispanic community. I would love to see diversity being grown in our church. But the fact of the matter is, there's a diversity that we often don't think about that should be here also, and that's in the gifts that are being used. We are a diverse church in the gifts that we have been given. The unity that we've talked about throughout Ephesians 1 is a gift of grace. We've been saved by grace. We've been delivered into the body of Christ by grace. And the word for grace there is charis. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 describe that so clearly. And the result of that grace that is given to us at salvation creates this unity that's described in Galatians 3.28. This is what it says. There is neither Jew or Greek, slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is what the grace of God does. It unifies us in one body of which Christ is the head. And now, as we come to our text today, we see that diversity within the church is also a gift of grace. But there's a different Greek word that's used there, charismata. And it's often translated gift. It's a gift. And this grace is given to all Christians. Every single person in here, whether you know it or not, you have received a gift. Now, we often hear that word used in reference to the charismatic movement. But the reality of it is every church is part of the charismatic movement in the sense that every believer in every church has received these gifts. Paul talks about these gifts in other places. If you want to turn there, you can. Otherwise, it'll pop up on the screen in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. This is what Paul says there. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads, do it with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, do it with cheerfulness. He talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as well, verses 4 through 11. Again, it will pop up on the screen. This is what it says. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. 
To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to the one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each individually as he wills. In our text this morning, Paul mentions these gifts that pertain to the teaching ministry within the body of Christ. This is what we read in our text. And he gave some to be apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. The apostles... And the prophets, those foundational members that were mentioned earlier in Ephesians, who laid the foundation of our doctrine and our beliefs, and now is contained in the scriptures. He is given to the body evangelists. In scripture, Timothy is called an evangelist. Stephen was called an evangelist. And he's given us pastors and shepherds and teachers, those who proclaim the scriptures for the edification and the building up of the body of Christ. Now, these graces are given to the church because Christ was victorious in his life, death, and resurrection. This is what our text tells us. He says, quoting Psalm 68, 8, these words. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led hosts captives and he gave gifts to men. So I don't know about you, but I found myself asking myself throughout this week, do I get excited when I read about these gifts? Is there something that gets excited when I hear that God has given to his church the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, the ministry of the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers? Do I get excited about that? Do you get excited about that? Is there something that wells up in you when you hear a preacher preaching and you thank God for that ministry given to the church for the building up? for the benefit of the church. Recently, I watched some YouTube videos. One of them was of a little child who was wanting to get a gift from their favorite hockey player. The hockey player came over to them and gave them his hockey stick. And it was such a cool video because what do you think the child did when he grabbed onto that hockey stick? He broke down sobbing that somebody would give him a gift like that. He couldn't stop. I almost wanted to cry watching it. I watched another video where Kobe Bryant gave away a pair of his shoes that had been signed by him to another child, and he did the same thing. He sobbed and he wept over the joy of receiving Kobe Bryant's shoes. So I wonder... Do we appreciate the gifts that Christ has given to us? When we really stop and think about all of these gifts that I just read, are we moved to gratitude? Our culture doesn't, especially not the ones we're talking about today. You believe in the teaching of the apostles and the prophets? Those guys who lived so many centuries before, what did they know? Our culture doesn't like evangelists. Most people in the church don't like evangelists. They don't respect the guy who has the guts to go stand on a street corner and preach that their sins are sending them to hell. I used to be one of those people. They don't appreciate the ministry of the faithful preacher and teacher who will stand up and preach the word in the fullness of it, even when it's things they don't want to hear. Proverbs 19.12 says, The scoffer does not like to be rebuked. He will not go to the wise. Most people won't go to these kinds of people. They don't want to be confronted by the wise, but they are gifts 
And Christ has reminded us today, Paul has reminded us in the text today that these gifts were given because there has been a great victory won. Paul is describing in our text by using Psalm 68 verse 18, a common scene that would have taken place often in the Roman Empire of a general who would defeat an army and have great victories and go in and plunder a city or some capital of some other place and then bring all of that back into the Roman capital. And there would be a great parade that was given to him and to those who had fought in that battle. In fact, it would be so grand that pride would often raise up within the hearts of the generals that would experience this. Behind their chariot would come all of the prisoners of war that they had taken captive to display these captives before the Roman city. And behind them would come all of the carriages and all of the chariots full of the loot and the gold and the silver and the precious things that had been taken from those countries. Dr. Sinclair Ferguson adds something to this event when he says that these were often so magnificent that a slave would ride in the chariot with the general, and he would say to him repeatedly, homo e, homo e, which means, remember, you are only a man. This was done because the general could begin to think he was something like a god because of all the honor that he was being given, because of all the accolades of men that were being shouted upon him, because of all of the things that he was experiencing in that moment. And then after all of this was done, they would divide up all of those spoils among the people. In our text today, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who has been victorious, who has won the battle, who has defeated the enemy, who comes triumphant onto the scene. And nobody needs to say home away to him because he is not just a man. He is the God man, fully God, fully man. He is the Messiah. He's the promised king of whose kingdom will never come to an end. There will be no enemy that can ever thwart his plan or ruin his rule. In fact, right before he died, right before he went onto that cross and prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. This is what he prayed in John 17, 5. Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He humbled himself, he came to earth, he looked like a man, but he was the promised Messiah. By contrast, one could say that it is the Father who continually whispers into our ear through the Holy Spirit, homo e, homo e, you are just a man. Turn with me to Psalm 2, if you would. This whole psalm, kind of describes this scene. It's a powerful psalm. This is what it says, starting in verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, and today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling." 
kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For the wrath is quickly, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Paul reminds us this morning that Christ in his life, death, and resurrection has disarmed the rulers and the authorities and that his triumphal procession, he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the cross. This is what Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in him. And when Jesus ascended victoriously into heaven, he asked for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And along with the Holy Spirit came all of these gifts that are described in Romans 12 and Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and then in our text today. And some would argue up to 40 or more listed in Scripture. John chapter 14, verse 16 says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. Acts chapter 2, verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out on you this day what you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Christ has given gifts to the church. And in our text today, it's the teaching ministry within the church. He has given us the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers. And in doing this, He has given us the opportunity to be equipped for ministry, each and every one of us to do ministry. He's given us the opportunity to have the body of Christ built up, maturing into the head, and to attain to the unity of the faith. All of these things we will talk about next week. Let me remind you as we come to a close that Paul prayed for the churches that they would grow in these things. Christ has answered that prayer by giving us these gifts. Paul prayed that we would be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation and that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. So we should rejoice at these gifts. We should treasure these gifts. We should love to sit under a sermon that brings such great conviction and challenge to our hearts and thank God that he is giving us these gifts. Martin Luther King kind of prayed a prayer, right? In the verse, or not the verse, in the quote that I read earlier, he says, one day we will learn that the heart can never be totally right if the head is totally wrong. One day, he said, we will learn that. Maybe this 4th of July weekend will be the beginning of that day for us. Maybe on this day, we will determine as a church to pursue what Paul is talking about here, to treasure the teachings of the apostles and the prophets, to treasure the gift of the evangelist and the shepherd and the teacher within the body of Christ. Perhaps today we will begin to treasure the fact that we want the wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of the Lord. Maybe today will be the day that we determine to come to a higher view of the word of the apostles and the prophets that are contained in Scripture and determine to live our life in light of God's Scriptures, of his commandments, of his rules, of his precepts, of his teachings there. Let them direct our every step. Today, maybe we will be reminded that through the preaching of the gospel, Our natures have been changed, and our minds can be transformed. Maybe today will be the day that we will be reminded that the heart can never be totally right if the mind is messed up. Therefore, we should seek to use our gifts in ministry for the betterment of this entire church. Perhaps we should leave here today and ask the Lord to show us what our gift is how we can be using our gift in the body of Christ, how we can build ourselves up because we are having to use our gift. Do you know how many times throughout the week somebody calls me, tells me they need to meet with me, 
Do I need to describe to you the panic that fills my heart in that moment? Do I need to share with you how fast I go running across my office to my desk and open up every counseling book to find out how to maybe counsel in a godly way in this situation? When you start using your gifts, you will start growing quickly. And we should be a church that does that. Let me end with this as we go to communion. Past generations have described what the basic elements of a church service should be. They said that they are basically divided up into these four things. A church service is the reading of God's word. A church service is the singing of God's word. A church service is the preaching of God's word. And a church service is the scene of the word in sacraments. It is a word-saturated experience. So join with me today as we get to do all three of the, or all four of these things. Today we have read God's word. Today we have sung God's word. Today we have preached the word. And now we get to see the word in the sacraments. We get to partake in communion today, together. We get to celebrate communion, this gift that Christ has given to us to play out what the gospel is, the breaking of Christ's body, the shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of sins. It's through this that every promise in Christ is yes and amen. There are some here today who need to be reminded of Christ's victory. You may be here today and you do not feel like Christ has overcome your worst sin. He has. He is the victorious warrior. And Satan and his minions and the demons and every other thing contrary to him is being led behind him in defeat. And so are all of your sins. They're gone in Christ. So as we celebrate communion today, receive God's forgiveness. Embrace God's fellowship. Embrace his promises. Father, I thank you for this text. I thank you for the gift of the church and the grace that you have poured out on each and every one of us that has saved us from our sins and our transgressions, our iniquities, our blasphemies. I thank you that your blood covers every single sin. I thank you that this grace teaches us to live in righteousness, that we have died with Christ. Now we can live in the power of Christ's resurrection. I thank you that as we take communion today, you will stir our hearts by the work of your Holy Spirit that we learned about at the end of Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do abundantly more than all we can ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So Holy Spirit, as we turn now to contemplate communion, as we confess our sins to you, as we as we Look to the gospel and to your son, Jesus Christ. I pray the Holy Spirit would be working in a powerful way in each and every one of us, Father God. I thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Hold on to your communion cups and we'll celebrate together.